Getting broadcast. All right. Hello, everyone. I see the participant windows uh, or counter ticking up uh, very, very quickly. That is, I'm very enthused to see that. My eye is right on those numbers, you guys. Welcome, welcome. Gather round. Hear ye, hear ye. Friends, Romans, countrymen, geeks, Canadians, muggles, hobbits, Hitchhikers, Vogons, Jedis, Wookiees, Vulcans, Klingons, and yes, us humans. Uh, welcome, you guys. Welcome one and all as you get into uh, the, uh, the group there. Welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. We had a fantastic turnout a couple of weeks ago for the debut of the series. So I want to definitely say thank you to our returning audience members. Welcome uh, to our new folks. And a special hello to those of you who are watching the recording of this presentation. Thank you for making the time to watch this at your leisure. It is much appreciated. We have people in our virtual audience from all across the country and around the world. I'm very glad that our international audience uh, is here with us. And if any of your countries are actually offering asylum, let us assist them know. You know, just hedging my bets here, you know, I think I'd be a lovely addition to your international comedy scene. And wow, I see about 200, over 200 of you uh, are already here and ready to go. So I will say welcome again to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Uh, this is a series, as you know, of live uh, online presentations uh, from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord. I am a stand-up comedian, author, uh, host of this program, and you might recognize my voice as one of the co-hosts of Point of Inquiry, the podcast for the Center for Inquiry. If you are not already, I hope you are subscribed and listening to Point of Inquiry wherever you happen to get your podcasts. Uh, I also hope that you have a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Uh, that's what all the cool kids are doing. And be sure to check out CFI's uh, Coronavirus Resource Center if you haven't. It, it's quite, um, hmm, what's the word? Resource. You can find that at centerforinquiry.org backslash coronavirus. And once again, that is CFI's Coronavirus Resource Center. And that is at centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. Now, as always, we do intend for the flow of the evening to be really easy breezy. I will introduce our guest. Uh, he does his thing. You will be educated and informed. And then we will have time for questions at the end. You'll notice that at the bottom of your screen there, probably a little off to the right, uh, there's an icon that says Q&A. And that's the place for you to type your questions. Uh, I again encourage you to phrase your question in the form of a question as succinctly as you can. And we will try on our end to get as many of your questions in and as possible within the hour. But let's get this ship out of dry dock, everybody. Uh, our guest this evening is a professor, a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is the co-inventor of, of a rotavirus vaccine. And if you're thinking, hmm, rotavirus, does that have anything to do with plumbing? Well, in a way, yeah, it does. Uh, rotavirus disease, of course, is a contagious virus that can cause inflammation of the stomach and the intestines, which is our internal plumbing. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, uh, it's most likely to affect infants and young children, which is why Dr. Paul uh, is, was involved and is on it. Uh, our guest uh, is the author of several books, including Do You Believe in Magic? The Sense and Nonsense of Alternative Medicine, uh, Bad Advice, which is my favorite title, well, my favorite subtitle, which is, uh, you know, Bad Advice or Why Celebrities, Politicians, and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information, and his latest book, which is Overkill, When Modern Medicine Goes Too Far. 
Now, I, I want to give our, uh, our guest an actual a personal thank you. Uh, one of his recent articles that's on his website uh, really made me clean out my vitamin cabinet. And he has subsequently saved me a lot of money, which I now spend on alcohol. <laughs> because, because unlike multivitamins, the effects of alcohol are proven. I, I say go with a winner. So, uh, and I will add this very quickly. I actually had the pleasure of meeting our guest last year when he gave an information packed talk at Nexus, the Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism. So uh, I've really been looking forward to hearing him tonight. Um, and and just, I, I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, so speaking to us tonight about a very, very hot topic, uh, developing a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is warp speed too fast. Please welcome Dr. Paul Offit. Doc, you have the con. Thank you very much. So um, what I want to talk about is, is, is where we stand on the development of a uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Um, here's, here's what is a typical vaccine timeline, so you can put this in perspective. Typically, you start with preclinical trials in experimental animals like mice or monkeys or ferrets, or in the case of SARS-CoV-2, Syrian hamsters. And you hope that when you inoculate them that they have signs and symptoms similar to what, uh, what happens with humans. Then what you do is you try your particular vaccine strategy. Um, you see whether it works. And more, most importantly, you can, frankly, literally dissect out that part of the immune response that is associated with protection. That's not very expensive. Then what you do is you go to phase one trials. You think that you have the, 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 the vaccine strategy that you're going to use, but you don't know the dose. So this is usually, these are usually dose ranging trials in 20 to, to 100 uh, um, volunteers typically. Then now you think you have the dose, and so you go to phase two, where you give the, now your vaccine to hundreds of people to make sure that it is consistently immunogenic, meaning it induces the immune response that you think but don't know is protective against disease, and that it's safe at least in a few hundred people. And that's, that's sort of, now you're in the sort of millions to tens of millions of dollar range. Then you go to phase three trials, which are um, typically uh, tens of thousands of people. Um, to prove that the vaccine is, is safe and to the extent that it doesn't have a relatively rare or relatively uncommon side effect, severe side effect, and to prove that it's effective. This is the only way you can prove that it's effective. I mean, phase one and phase two trials buy you tickets to the dance, but the dance is phase three trials, so that can't be skipped. So how about this vaccine? So there are at least 120 investigational new drug applications that submitted to the FDA. There are about 100 products out there that are being uh, pursued. There's actually more than it says 70 here, but there's more than 100 companies across the globe that are interested. And there's a ton of money. BARDA, the World Health Organization, and the Gates Foundation have given a little less than $10 billion to push these vaccines forward. Um, there have been no or limited animal model studies. Usually the phase one dose ranging studies are small. And, and for the most part, the phase two studies are skipped. Um, also, these are not going to be FDA licensed products. They're going to be approved or authorized under the emergency use authorization. Usually licensure takes about a year. If it's an expedited review, it takes about nine months. That's being skipped. And then, then the, the, the most important thing, actually, is that the, the government has essentially taken the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. I mean, the, the pharmaceutical company will go from phase one, then to phase two, then to phase three, each time making a bigger and bigger bet uh, to make sure that they don't make the biggest bet of all, which is then mass producing the vaccine without knowing whether it works and without knowing whether it's safe. The government says, we'll do that for you. We'll pay for phase three. We'll pay for, for mass production, which is the so-called warp speed program. Um, and that, that really dramatically shortened the timeline. But the one thing you can't truncate or skip are phase three trials. This is the only way you can prove whether or not a vaccine doesn't have a, a relatively uncommon severe side effect problem, and the only way you can prove whether it works. And as I'll get to a little later in this talk, it does worry me that we may, um, as we move along in this, um, try and truncate those trials. Okay, so the virus. Um, this um, goes through sort of the, what we know about uh, human coronaviruses. There are four human coronaviruses that were first identified in the 1960s. They cause coughs and colds and sore throats and respiratory disease, primarily pneumonia. Um, I would say 15 to 20% of the respiratory viruses we see come into our hospital, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, every year are caused by these human coronaviruses. 
more recently, starting in 2002, um, there have been novel coronaviruses that have been derived from, from animals like bats and, and uh, camels, and um, they have made their debut in the human population. The first was SARS-CoV-1 in 2002, followed by MERS, and now we have SARS-CoV-2, which is basically a bat coronavirus that has just made its debut in us. Um, this is a, a cartoon of the virus, but the key protein of the virus, the one that we're all focusing on, is the protein that spikes out from the surface of the virus. It's, uh, it, what's, it's what makes the virus look like a crown, which is where the word corona comes from. That's the protein that attaches the virus to cells. Um, if you can prevent the virus from attaching to cells with antibodies, then you can prevent the virus from entering cells and causing disease. So this, this is the focus is that spike protein, the S protein. This is just a sort of higher powered view of it. Um, the, the key part of that protein, the, the specific part that attaches to cells is called the receptor binding domain. So if you can make antibodies to that receptor binding domain, um, you can prevent entrance of the virus. Okay, so there are a number of vaccine strategies that are being used. I'm gonna go through them and, uh, and uh, try and highlight where we stand. So we'll start with sort of whole killed virus. So this, these, these, the first three approaches I'm gonna to talk to you about are well-worn approaches. I mean, they're things that we've been doing now for decades and decades. So there's a lot of commercial um, experience with the, these strategies. Um, one is to take the virus, grow it up and kill it. Um, it's the, it's so-called inactivated viral approach, viral vaccine approach. It's the way we make the inactivated polio vaccine. It's the way we make the hepatitis A vaccine and the rabies vaccines. The, the, the concern about this has to do with two events that occurred in the 1960s. It was in, in the 1960s, researchers at the National Institutes of Health, Health took respiratory syncytial virus, which is a common cause of respiratory disease, especially in young children, and they inactivated it with a chemical. They then gave it to children or didn't give it to children. And they found that those who got the vaccine, when they then were, were confronted naturally with wild type or circulating respiratory syncytial virus, did much worse. The vaccinated group did much worse. They were much more likely to, uh, to develop pneumonia, they were much more likely to be hospitalized, and they were much more likely to die than the group that never got the RSV vaccine. Um, similarly, there was a measles vaccine that was introduced in the United States commercially, and the, the RSV vaccine never made it to a commercial product, but there was a measles vaccine in 1963 that was introduced, made the same way, just taking the virus, killing it, in this case with formaldehyde, which was also true with RSV, and, um, and same thing happened. Um, children who got the vaccine were worse off. They were more likely to develop this kind of weird pneumonia than, uh, than children who didn't get the vaccine. The reason that this is important is that both of those viruses, and when they attach to cells, they actually fuse to cells. They don't just sort of bind and then are taken up by a process of endocytosis. They fuse to the cell and then enter it. That's relevant here because the SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, protein, the, uh, the spike protein, is also a fusion protein. So I think people are very concerned about using this approach. China is probably the furthest along. They're already actually in phase three um, with their inactivated vaccine. And they didn't use formaldehyde, frankly, for that reason. They used an inactivating uh, agent called beta propiolactone, which is the same inactivating agent that's used to make the rabies vaccine. Okay, so now you go to sort of live attenuated viral vaccines, again, with which we have a lot of experience. It's the way we make the measles vaccine, the mumps vaccine, the rubella vaccine, or German measles vaccine, the chicken pox vaccine, and then one of the rotavirus vaccines. There are a number of companies, pretty much all in China, that are pursuing this approach. This usually is kind of the one that takes the longest because you have to, to attenuate it uh, just enough, but not too much, not too little. And, um, but there are now three vaccines that are currently in phase three uh, in China with this approach. The third approach, which is again, well-worn, is a purified viral protein approach. In this case, the, the purified protein is gonna be the, the spike protein. Um, this is the way that we make the hepatitis B vaccine, the human papillomavirus vaccine, and one of the influenza vaccines, specifically a vaccine called flu block. Um, this is being pursued by CSL, which is an Australian company, and then Novavax, among others. Here, the spike protein uh, can be synthesized using either a yeast or baculovirus expression system. Um, so for example, when you make the human papillomavirus vaccine or the hepatitis B vaccine, the way you make that is you take the, if you look at the left-hand portion of this slide, you take the gene that codes for the surface protein. So again, it's always the surface protein you care about because you're trying to prevent the virus from binding the cells. 
In the case of the human papillomavirus, um, that surface protein is called L the L1 protein. So you take the gene that codes for the L1 protein, you then put it into a yeast plasmid. That plasmid is then uh, put into yeast cells, specifically into the uh, nucleus of yeast, yeast cells. And then when the yeast cell, which is just really common baker's yeast, reproduces itself, it also makes that protein. The protein sort of forms a capsid and ultimately uh, forms what looks like a virus-like particle. It's really pretty amazing. If you look at this vaccine under the electron microscope, it, the, it looks just like HPV, the virus. The difference obviously being that it doesn't have the viral genome, so it can't reproduce itself, but that's that vaccine. Um, the, this is a more relevant uh, system to the current story because this is a so-called baculovirus express system. Baculovirus is just essentially a butterfly virus, an insect virus. Um, you, you take um, insect cells, you infect them with this insect virus into which you've cloned or genetically engineered the, the gene that codes for the spike proteins. This is a sort of common theme here genes that code for spike proteins. And then again, as the, as the virus reproduces itself, it, it forms the, um, this, uh, the, the, essentially the, uh, the spike protein forms as a little rosette. Um, th this um, is being pursued by Novavax, no doubt with a, um, an adjuvant. Actually, the adjuvant they're, they're using is similar to the adjuvant that's in the shingles vaccine, Shingrix, so it is a powerful adjuvant. I don't know if any of you are or old enough to have gotten the shingles vaccine, but usually they ask you to get that vaccine on a Friday so that you don't miss time from work um, because it really uh, kind of knocks you out. Okay, so th this is a, um, a, a publication actually by the Novavax group um, on, their, on their spike protein. And, and this, this, this actually, among all the vaccines actually, this one probably induces uh, the highest titers of neutralizing antibodies, or said another way, an antibodies that neutralize the ability of the virus to infect cells. Okay, so now we go to, um, to um, vaccine strategies with which there is essentially no experience in an American population. And we'll go to the replicating viral vectors. So th this is the same strategy that's used to make the dengue vaccine and then one of the Ebola vaccines that's being pursued by Merck among others. Um, it is one of the vaccines that's included in warp speed. Warp speed is just this sort of the manufacturing um, arm of this particular uh, um, operation it is still in preclinical trials. But the, the way that this is done is you take a virus like vesicular stomatitis virus, which is a virus that can reproduce itself in people, but it doesn't cause disease in people. And then you genetically engineer it so that it contains the gene that codes for the spike protein. So that when the virus reproduces itself, um, it makes that spike protein and then you make antibodies. So, so here again, what's happening is, as distinct from the other strategies that I talked about, your body is making the coronavirus spike protein and then your body is making antibodies to the spike protein. Um, next is replication defective viral vectors. This is probably the one you've heard the most about because this is the UK group that managed, must have a huge public relations firm because they are in the news all the time. So what, here what you do is you take a virus like an adenovirus, which is a, a human virus um, and a simian virus that can uh, cause disease in people. Uh, it can cause common colds, but it can cause diseases worse than that. It can cause more severe respiratory diseases. It can cause uh, intestinal diseases. And you re-engineer it so it cannot reproduce itself. It is replication defective. But it is genetically engineered to contain the gene that codes for the spike protein. So what happens here is you're inoculated with the, this virus. It's taken up by cells. The, the, um, the, that protein is then transcribed and, and uh, tra the gene is transcribed and then translated to a protein. And, um, and then again, you make the protein, you make antibodies to the protein. Um, the, the, the difficulty here is that because the virus is replication defective, because it doesn't reproduce itself, you give a lot of virus. I mean, usually people are inoculated using this strategy with about 10 billion virus particles, which is why um, the studies that have been done here so far, which are largely phase one studies, dose ranging studies, more than 50% of people will have fever, including high fever, as well as um, the symptoms of fever, like headache, muscle ache, and chills. Um, this, this particular, there are a bunch of adenovirus vectors that are being pursued. One is uh, by a group called CanSino Biologics in China. The adenovirus they use is an adenovirus serotype 5, which was surprising actually because adenovirus 5 is actually fairly common in, in, the, uh, in the population. And so the, when they did their studies um, of, of this particular vaccine, they actually screened out people who already had antibodies to adenovirus type 5 because obviously they, they, if they did, it would neutralize the virus before it ever was able to enter cells. 
Um, I think that's sort of the weakness of this. But to the credit of this particular group, this was the first paper that was published in a medical journal about, about a coronavirus vaccine. I mean, up until this, till this point, which was in July, I think, uh, all we were doing was reading press releases and preprints. I mean, it was science by press release. It was really very frustrating. You just were sort of trying to take, you know, these companies word for what they were doing. You just didn't know. Um, the, these data weren't all that impressive, actually. Um, the, the neutralizing antibody titers didn't compare that favorably to just the neutralizing antibody titers uh, that, that happened after natural infection. Um, and this, this particular approach, the replication defective adenotype 5, is one of the two, two viruses or vaccine strains that's contained in the Russian vaccine. Um, I don't know if you any if you followed this over the last few days, but Vladimir Putin said that he has a vaccine. It's checked all the boxes. He's given it to his daughter, on, uh, and they're going to start making the vaccine and giving it to Russian citizens in September. Um, if you look more closely, actually, all they've done is a phase one trial in 39 people, and presumably nobody died, and they induced an immune response. I wouldn't call that checking all the, the boxes. They haven't done a phase three trial. They're starting going to start a phase three trial. Um, next week, and I can't imagine they could finish a phase three trial uh, within any, any sooner than three or four months. So I don't know what Vladimir T Putin was talking about when he said that. I think it was just sort of this political theater, this political stunt that he did to try and, and say, look, we win, we're the first to approve a vaccine, but they're, they're, not are they no further along than what's going on here, um, they're probably a little further behind. Um, the other the other approach is a replication defective adenovirus 26, which is actually the other half of the Russian vaccine. They have actually two vaccines in one. Um, this is a current platform that's been used for one of the Ebola vaccines that's being pursued by Johnson & Johnson, Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Um, they've completed preclinical studies and phase one and phase two. This is a warp speed finalist. The advantage of this is that um, this virus is not common. So um, unlike adenovirus type five, it's much more likely, I think, to induce an immune response. And then lastly, there's the replication defective simian adenoviruses. Again, monkey viruses aren't really well adapted to growth in people, so that's the advantage here. Um, and this also has been um, data that were published. You know, this, for those of us who sort of follow this closely, this was an upsetting publication. It, it's, it was billed as a 1,000-person study of people who got this replication defective simian adenovirus from the UK group, which is at the University of Oxford, the Jenner Institute at the University of Oxford. But if you took a closer look at this 1,000-person study, it was far less than that. What they did was they inoculated 500 people with meningococcal vaccine, and then they inoculated 500 people with this replication defective simian virus, which adenovirus, which then co for the, uh, the uh, spike protein. They inoculated 542 people with that vaccine. Then they took 35 people to look to see whether those 35 people developed neutralizing antibodies. Well, what happened to the other 508 people? I'm sure they were inoculated. So why is it that they weren't tested? Um, no, no indication for why that, those 35 people were chosen. It's not that hard to do neutralizing antibody titers. Um, but in any case, in the 35 people that were tested, the neutralizing antibody titers were, didn't compare, frankly, all that favorably to the neutralizing antibody titers found after natural infection. And they looked at four different assays, four different neutralizing antibody assays, which, you know, to a scientist looks like assay shopping, you know, that they're just trying to find the assay that makes it look the best. So they weren't all that crazy about the response. So what they then did was they took non-randomly 10 people and gave them a second dose and found that those who got a second dose had a better neutralizing response. And, and so the question is, is AstraZeneca, who's moving forward with this product, is are they doing a one or two dose vaccine? And supposedly they're doing a two dose vaccine, which means that this thousand person study was really a study of 10 people. Okay, next is um, messenger RNA vaccine, which has gotten a lot of play through uh, Moderna, who also must have a huge public relations team, um, and Pfizer also is pursuing this, as well as a number of other com com companies. Um, they've completed preclinical trials, phase one and two, and certainly they're already in phase three. Moderna and Pfizer are actually already in phase three. Um, the challenge of this is, is that messenger RNA is a labile molecule. I mean, it's like the good news, bad news. The good news is messenger RNA breaks down very quickly in your body. Um, the bad news is, is messenger RNA breaks down very quickly outside of your body. So it's sort of hard to stabilize it. So it's stabilized with a complex lipid delivery system, which can be quite reactive, reactogenic. The way that this works 
is that you inoculate people then with this messenger RNA, which has, not surprisingly, the gene that codes for now the uh, spike protein. And that, that when it enters the cytoplasm is of, of a cell, is just translated then to that protein. So again, you make the spike protein, you make antibodies to the spike protein. Typically that happens in muscle cells, but as you can see on the bottom portion of this slide, it also can happen uh, in, in so-called antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells or macrophages. And this too is a publication. Um, this is a phase one uh, study, which is to say 45 people that were divided into three groups of 15 each. They were given 25 micrograms of messenger RNA, uh, 100 or 250 micrograms. They settled on the 100 microgram group as a, and again, as a two dose trial. And as soon as they published this paper, they talked about how uh, they could make tens of millions of doses. I'd say this is a little unnerving. I mean, maybe I'm a bad sport. I mean, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that created the rotavirus vaccine. Um, that was a 26 year effort. And, um, and you know, you, you sort of go slowly just to make sure that at each step of the way you have a product that is safe and, and initially immunogenic and later effective. And just when you do a small phase one trial and then go to the press and talk about how you can make tens of millions of doses, it's a little unnerving because I think the history of medical breakthroughs is littered with human tragedy. I mean, we learn as we go and often there's a price to be paid for knowledge. And I just think that you should be a little more humble in the face of nature, which generally gives its secrets up fairly slowly. I mean, just taking a step back for a second, this is a novel coronavirus. It's a bad coronavirus. It's just been around for about eight months and it's already had a number of surprises. I mean, it, it is, um, it affects children in a way that, that nobody's ever seen before with a virus, meaning it causes this combination of a disease called Kawasaki's, which is this multi-system, multi-organ disease and toxic shock syndrome, which is as bad as it sounds. Um, it causes vasculitis, meaning inflammation of blood vessels. I mean, what respiratory virus does that? It, it affects the endothelial cells that line blood vessels, I, I, causing one syndrome I'd never seen before from a virus, which is COVID toes, which, which looks like frostbite. It, um, it, it affects nursing homes disproportionately. I mean, there are a lot of respiratory viruses that, that kill older people, flu being one of them. But influenza virus, uh, uh, the flu deaths every year, there are you know, fewer than 10% are in nursing homes. With this virus, it's more than 40%. In some areas, it's more than 50%. And then lastly, and frankly, most surprisingly, this virus um, is spread in the summer months. I mean, what, what small droplet spread envelope respiratory virus does that. Flu doesn't do that. Respiratory syncytial virus doesn't do that. Parainfluenza doesn't do that. This virus thrives in hot and humid climates. It's just, it is unex, unexplainable. Usually envelope viruses don't do well in the heat and viruses that are spread by small droplets don't do well in the humidity because that those small droplets acquire water and drop much more quickly. So that's also a surprise. So you have four surprises and we're only eight months into this. And how are we going to counter this? Right now, the leading candidates are the ones that I just mentioned last, which are these basic plug and play vaccines, these genetic vaccines, um, which are very easy to make. You know the protein you're interested in, you know, which is the spike protein, you know the gene that makes that's associated with that spike pro protein, and you just plug it into mRNA, you plug it into DNA, you know, you plug it into, into these replication defective or viruses or replication competent viruses, and it's very easy to scale them up. So the reason that these are going to be the first out of the gate is not because they're necessarily the best, it's because they're the fastest to make. So, and, and, and they're the ones with which you have virtually no commercial experience. So here you have this difficult to, uh, to characterize uh, elusive virus that you are now going to try and counteract with a series of vaccine strategies which, with which you have no experience. I think it is fair to say that we're gonna learn a lot over the next two years that we wish we knew now. And I really do wish that some of these company uh, folks who step forward would be a little more uh, cognizant of that and a little more humble. Okay, so this, that was the last, this last one was uh, the Moderna paper, this is the Pfizer paper, all, all sort of small phase one dose ranging trials. Okay, then lastly, DNA, which I, I already mentioned. Um, this is being pursued by a Plymouth meeting Pennsylvania company called Inovio. Um, here, it's the same idea. You're just, in this case, instead of doing messenger RNA, you start with DNA. The DNA, of, again, the gene that codes for the spike protein is then transcribed to a messenger RNA, which is then translated to a protein. Because it has to be transcribed, it has to enter the nucleus. And the only way it can enter the nucleus is when you essentially damage the cell at some level by electroporation. And this is just the electroporation gun that is used to do that it does hurt a little bit. 
Okay, so regarding phase three trials, um, as you, you, this is a CDC slide actually, you can see that um, Moderna with their mRNA has already entered phase three trials. AstraZeneca, actually it says to be determined here, but they've actually already entered phase three. And then the Janssen, which is, these are all adeno, the replication defective adenoviruses um, has, has, uh, is, is, hasn't entered, but will soon enter uh, phase three. And then Novavax, which is the recombinant protein, similar to flu block, which is just, just a single protein. Um, that too is going to start soon. So, so that's sort of the lay of the land regarding phase three trials. Although whenever I see OWS, which stands for Operation Warp Speed, I always see I see it as Occupy Wall Street. You know, which is a really different thing. So I have to, to sort of get over that. So the, the, this shows you the more than 100 sites that are available to NIH as they're moving forward with these trials, both in the United States, South America, and Africa. Okay, so managing expectations. I think this is going to be the key to this whole thing. Regarding safety, um, if we test this vaccine, if we do take this through to uh, 30,000 people, let's say 20,000 get a vaccine, 10,000 don't, and we can say that 20,000 people got a vaccine safely, that's not 20 million people. And when you put the vaccine out there, you're only going to detect rare serious adverse events post-licensure or post-approval in this case. That's always true. I mean, Maurice Hilleman, who I consider to be the father of modern vaccines, since he either did the primary research or development on nine of the 14 vaccines that we currently give to, uh, to children, he said it best. He said, quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first three million doses are out there. And that's never going to be a pre-licensure phenomenon. So in place are these systems like the vaccine safety data link, and the post-licensure rapid immunization safety monitoring program, so-called PRISM uh, program, where tens of billions of people are connected via um, computerized medical record systems through their HMO. So you can very quickly see who's gotten a vaccine, who hasn't gotten a vaccine, and whether or not uh, those who've gotten the vaccine seem to be suffering from um, serious adverse events. So th this is, um, these are both hypothesis generating and hypothesis testing uh, systems. Regarding efficacy, this is probably the most common question that I get asked, um, in addition to which vaccine is my favorite. Um, but the, the, the question that gets asked is, what percentage of the American population would have to be vaccinated in order to stop spread? So that depends on two factors. One, the contagiousness of the virus, otherwise known as the R0. Um, the R0 for this virus is around two, meaning that, that if I'm uh, sick with this virus and shedding virus, and uh, I just go about my normal day, and everybody I come in contact with is susceptible to this virus, I'll infect two more people. Um, and, and the vaccine efficacy. Those are, so the, obviously, the, the more effective the vaccine, the fewer you would, the fewer, uh, a smaller percentage of the population you would need to vaccinate. The more contagious the virus, the larger the population you'd have to vaccinate. And it's actually a formula. They're shown on that second bullet point. That's the formula. So for example, if the R0 is two and the vaccine efficacy is 75%, you would need to vaccinate about two thirds of the population to stop to stop spread. Now, what's a little tricky about that is and when, you, when you, you are going to start to hear about the efficacy of these vaccines, if you hear that the efficacy is 75%, the clinical endpoints for these vaccines are moderate to severe disease. That's the endpoint. Nobody's trying to prevent infection, and nobody's trying to prevent mild symptoms associated with infection because those aren't a big deal. What's a big deal is moderate to severe symptoms because that's what gets you into the hospital, and that's what gets you into the morgue. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get my mild uh, symptoms or, or be asymptomatic, in which case you could still shed. So I think that, that if, if, um, if this vaccine is what you hope it would be, which is 75% effective, I think that's a reasonable goal and a sort of somewhat of a high goal. That means that one out of every four people who gets the vaccine isn't going to be protected. And it means that probably many of those who get the vaccine are probably still at risk for getting infected and mildly symptomatic or, or asymptomatic, in which case they could still shed. So the, the concept I'm going to about to bring up is one I think it's going to be very hard for the American public to swallow, is that even if you're vaccinated, you probably should still wear a mask. Uh, you're still, because you're still at risk of, of getting an infection, even a moderate to severe infection, and it's hard enough to get people to wear the, uh, the masks now. Okay, so this just to finish this off, if the vaccine efficacy was 100%, which is true of no vaccine, then 50% of the population would need to be immunized. If the vaccine efficacy was only 50%, which they're actually uh, saying would be their minimal accepted level of efficacy, then 100% of the population would need to be immunized, which is also not possible because there are people who can't be immunized. 
Um, this is another point, actually, just to, to make the point that um, there is there are racial disparities between um, in terms of vaccine uptake. And I think that really needs to be considered in terms of managing expectations. So when we do these trials, and I'm actually on the NIH uh, active group as well as um, I'm on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, but that we have really pushed to make sure that these groups are adequately represented, that people who are elderly, people who have uh, um, uh, various medical problems, African-American populations, uh, 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 healthcare workers, et cetera, are all adequately represented. So when we, we roll these vaccines out, we can, we can you know, say that, yes, your group has been tested, and here was the efficacy in your group. And I think that the messaging is going to be different, I think, for those different groups, and that's going to be a challenge. OK, regarding availability, this is a CDC slide um, presented by Sarah Mabue um, a couple weeks ago at an, at an advisory committee for immunization practices meeting. She was trying to tell us what the um, the first round of vaccine vaccinees will look like. In other words, who's the priority group? And and she listed a few groups here: healthcare personnel, essential workers like people who arguably teachers, uh, people who work in meatpacking plants, people in grocery stores, people who work in mass transit, um, you know, people who work uh, in pharmacies, etc. Adults aged uh, greater than or equal to 65, long-term health facility residents, i.e. nursing home residents and, and uh, personnel that work there, and then people with high-risk medical conditions, among others. And if you just consider that group, that would be an estimated 121 million people. And, and think about how uh, logistically difficult this is going to be. I mean, th these are all going to be two-dose vaccines. So you're, you're, you have to roll 240 million doses out. Into, into most into, into these groups, you have to identify who these groups are, make sure they come back for a second dose. Um, and you have to have points of care that can't just be doctor's offices and pharmacies. I think it's gonna uh, require more than that um, in order to get this out there. And, and it's being run, so you're wondering who is in charge of this. Um, it's the federal government, that same government that uh, couldn't supply face masks uh, and personal pr protective equipment and testing and contact tracing, and even arguably a reasonable sort of hygienic program. Uh, that's, that's who it is. And it's, it's really the Department of Defense working through a warp speed who's going to be doing this. They haven't made clear exactly what their plan is, which has been frustrating because um, the National Governors Association and, and sort of state health departments are, are really anxious to sort of now figure out how they are going to be distributing these vaccines, which I think in all likelihood will probably be uh, rolling out uh, early next year. And uh, the, the Department of Defense uh, that's been in charge of this hasn't been terribly forthcoming in telling us exactly what that plan is. Okay, regarding an October surprise, um, yes, yeah, sorry, this was the only slide I could find that said Operation Warp Speed, but uh, the, the concern, and as Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel and I actually wrote an op-ed about this in the New York Times, the concern is that there, there are some pressures that are gonna be coming up, not the least of which is the election in November 3rd that could force the administration to do something they shouldn't do, which is to, to, to not finish phase three trials, to say, okay, you know, these vaccines, a couple of these warp speed vaccines have been in thousands of people. It looks to be safe. They induce great immune responses and let's get it out there. More than a thousand people are dying every day. Let's get these vaccines out there. And I, I think that would be a mistake because what you're do, if you do that, you're asking to be lucky. Um, you're asking to be lucky that these vaccines work as well as you think they should, and you're asking to be lucky that it doesn't cause a, a relatively uncommon, very serious side effect. I think we, we should let this play out the way it's played out for the last 70 years, which has finished the phase three trials. And these pressures are going to come, I think, not only from the upcoming election. I think they're also going to be coming from China, which may you know, release a vaccine to its population before they finish phase three trials. I think that may happen in, in Russia, which, which according to what Vladimir Putin said. And um, I think that may happen in the United Kingdom with the sort of association between Boris Johnson and the UK group uh, at, at Oxford. So I, I do worry about this. I mean, we may get lucky and that the, the um, that, uh, that these, these vaccines are, are effective, but I, I can start, you're starting to hear even from some members of the um, CDC, the notion of doing something called a wedge trial, which is, is the way that the Ebola vaccine uh, was tested, which is to say that, and that was using replication defective um, uh, human adenovirus or in, in another uh, uh, um, vaccine strategy was the vesicular stomatitis virus uh, for Ebola that contained the Ebola virus uh, surface protein, which is to say you just roll a vaccine out 
and you know, not everybody's going to get it all at once. Some people will get it, some people won't get it. And then you can look retrospectively to see what the safety was, and you can look retrospectively to see what the efficacy was. We may get lucky. I, I, I hope it doesn't come to that. I know a lot of people don't want it to play out that way. And you know, but the fact of the matter is, this is a, a, uh, an administration which has been willing to perturb the science. I mean, they were able to get the EPA to take the term vaccine uh, or take, take the term climate change off their website. They were able to get um, the National Weather Service to sort of buckle under regarding uh, their description of Hurricane Dorian and when it came up into the southeast and, you know, whether it, it went into Alabama or not. And then most egregiously, I think, they were able to get the FDA to, through, under an emergency use authorization, to um, approve the use of hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of COVID-19 when there was no evidence that it worked. There was clear evidence that it had a 10% incidence of, uh, of arrhythmias. And um, now we know it didn't work. Now we know that it didn't work to either treat or prevent the disease. And still, you have people in the administration pushing this drug. I mean, it's, it's really been hard to watch. So I think, I think that uh, this is not the science administration. I'll put it that way. So uh, I, do, I do worry about this. Uh, what makes me a little less concerned was an op-ed piece that just appeared a few days ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, one of the, the signatories or writers of this was Stephen Hahn, who's the commissioner of the FDA. And what, what he said in, in this uh, op-ed piece was, given the widespread potential use of the COVID-19 vaccine, transparent discussion of FDA's vaccines and related biological products uh, advisory committee, otherwise known as the FDA's vaccine advisory committee, will be needed prior to vaccine authorization or licensure to ensure clear public understanding of the evidence supporting vaccine safety and efficacy. The key word here is efficacy. I mean, the, the, you know, the only way you're going to be able to prove efficacy is by completion of a phase three trial or best case scenario that, that you accrue enough people in your placebo group that, um, you know, that's at least 150 who have moderate to severe disease so that you can make a statement then about whether or not it really is effective. But, you know, there's a lot of things that work against you here. First of all, it's these are 30,000 person trials. I mean, you have to recruit 30,000 people. You have to give them dose one. Then you wait a month to give them dose two. It takes about two weeks after that to get full immunity after that second dose. And then remember, you're telling them to wear masks. You're telling them to social distance and wash their hands. You're not telling them all to go to you know, Sturgis, South Dakota and hang out with bikers. I mean, you, you really don't want them to get sick. On the other hand, you're never gonna know whether a vaccine is effective unless a critical number in uh, the placebo group does get sick. So um, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I really cannot imagine that the, these vaccines could be ready by October or November, which is what you occasionally hear. Okay, regarding the anti-vaccine movement, because they're always around, um, I, I would divide this into two groups. The first are, are a reasonable group, which I would call vaccine skeptics. Um, this was a study done by the Boston Globe, a poll where they asked uh, whether you would accept a, a coronavirus vaccine. Two thirds of Americans said they would accept it. One third they said they wouldn't accept it. I actually was encouraged by this. I mean, if you ask me whether I would accept a theoretical COVID vaccine, I would say no. I, I would wait to see the data. I, it's it's good to be skeptical, right? I mean, hence your, the name of this organization. I mean, you know, you, you want to you want to question anything that you put into your body. So I, this is good. I, I think I think we should be skeptical. And I think when we we release these vaccines, I think we need to be very transparent about what we know and what we don't know. I mean, when when you release vaccines or any medical product. I mean, you do these, these progressive trials to reduce uncertainty, but you never eliminate uncertainty. And there are things you don't know, but you know, you'll find those things out post-licensure. You just have to be open-minded to it. I think the, the, the other group, which um, is more worrisome, is the, sort of the, the, the vaccine cynics, if you will. I mean, people that just believe that it's all a conspiracy. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. I don't recommend it. It's called uh, Plandemic. Um, it's made by the anti-vaccine people, and it, they, they sound they're, they're all the sort of similar uh, conspiracy theory tropes that you hear from the anti-vaccine folks, which, which is hydroxychloroquine cures COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 was manipulated to create a pandemic strain, that the influenza vaccine increases your chance of getting COVID-19, or that the influenza vaccine actually contains SARS-CoV-2. In addition, that microbes in the ocean cure COVID-19, that wearing a protective mask activates SARS-CoV-2, which I think actually Louis Gohmert recently from Texas might have believed, um, Bill Gates, that Bill Gates created SARS-CoV-2 pandemic so that he could make money selling vaccines to prevent it because presumably $60 billion is not enough, that COVID-19 death statistics have been manipulated to control the public, and lastly, that th this particular movie was viewed by 8 million people in the first week. So that is the end of this talk. Thank you for your attention, and I will take any questions that you have.
Wow. Dr. Paul, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Let me get my window back up here so I can see you. Um, that, that talk was warp speed. <laughs> <laughs> You had a you had a lot of information in there, I, you know. I and I remembered you from from Nexus. I should have told the audience buckle up because it's <laughs> going to be coming at you. Uh, there was a lot there. I'm really surprised there was no slide of COVID toes. I think we all would have wanted to see that. Do that. I will do next that. time. Next time. Um, I, I think I agree with you. But the only thing I think that's scarier than science by press release is science by tweet. Um, which is which is worse, and I think I, and I may not have to confirm my sources here, but Vladimir Putin got his daughter to take the the vaccine um, uh, by saying that if she didn't, she'd be out of the will. Uh, I know that has encouraged me to do many things with my parents, and it's good to know that a vaccination is not a get out of mask free card. You still have to wear the mask. This is good, uh, so less fighting at Walmart. But I do think that one of the most powerful things you said is that history is a breakthrough. History's breakthroughs are littered with human tragedy and that should inspire us to be a little bit more cognizant and humble. Um, that, that should be on everybody's billboard. <laughs> everybody's screensaver right there as we plunge ahead. But we do have uh, quite a few questions um, in the chat and I will try to get through as many as I can. Um, even if I think you kind of covered it already, just to make sure um, and you guys, you, you were so great on your questions, everybody. All, not all 270 of you asked questions, uh, but you've made them succinct. Uh, what we didn't do is increase the font size in the Q&A box. <laughs> <laughs> so I put my glasses on so I make sure I get these right. Um, let's see, Marilyn S. says she's very concerned about the number of people and the demographics that different vaccines will have to be tested on. Uh, will there be any way of getting this information? Did that question make sense, sir? Yes, and there will be. I mean, I think I think the when I read you that sort of quote from Stephen Hahn about um, taking these vaccines to an FDA vaccine advisory committee, those committees are open to the public. Those meetings are open to the public. So all the data that we see about phase three trials, which will include certainly the, the degree to which those uh, those subpopulations are represented, <coughs> will be available to the public. They have to be. I mean, you, I think at the very least, we have to be very transparent about what we know and what we don't know. It's going to be, I think, hard to convince people to get these vaccines because it is a new vaccine because a lot of the language around this has been awful, including warp speed, race for a vaccine, finalist. It sounds yeah. like, like, you know, safety guidelines are being skipped and things are being truncated. So I think we've scared people a little bit and you can understand it. So yeah, yes. Yeah, the, yeah, completely. And even, even as a Star Trek fan, like warp speed is usually yay. And now it's like, oh, it, it does make me nervous that, uh, that we are cutting unnecessary corners. Um, uh, Upa, excuse me, Ugo asks, what do you think of human challenge trials as a way to speed up the development of a new vaccine? Right. So, so the, the group that was put together by Francis Collins, the so-called NIH active group, ACTIV, which just stands for Accelerating COVID-19 Technological Innovations and Vaccines, um, has, has a subcommittee of looking at human challenge trials. The subcommittee, for the most part, decided that it was not a great idea. It, although it sounds easy, it's not so easy. The, the reason being that, that, that in, under a natural experiment, which is what we're doing now in these phase three trials. There will be people who will be exposed to smaller and, and larger and larger amounts of the virus. As a general rule, the larger amount of the virus that you're exposed to, the more likely you are to get moderate to severe disease, the so-called inoculum mm -hmm. effect. Um, you're not going to do that in human challenge trials. I mean, you're going to, to try and titrate that dose to probably uh, mild symptoms, not to moderate to severe disease, when you have a virus for which there is no rescue drug. I mean, it's a little unnerving. Also, you're never going to test that, that uh, human challenge trial in the elderly. Uh, nobody's going to do that. So I think that we're sort of stuck with this, although you'll be happy to know that there are groups now working at trying to titrate that dose. I just don't see it. I, I know that AstraZeneca has talked about with the UK vaccine uh, doing human challenge trials, but they've just talked about it so far. I haven't seen any evidence they've done it. And I, I will readily admit to not being uh, the smartest person in the room. Uh, so can you just tell, uh, uh, tell me or, or the folks who might not know what exactly is a challenge trial? I'm sorry. So what you do is you actually inoculate the person with the virus. You give them the vaccine, you know, give them a second dose, and then you wait a few weeks, and then you actually inoculate SARS-CoV-2 into their nose ah. and see whether or not they're protected. You give them the virus. Oh, oh well, then I pass. <laughs> <laughs> 
just say. Uh, okay, thank you for your, your question. Um, Peter wants to know, is taking multiple vaccines a good idea? I'm not sure what he means by that exactly. I mean, if, if, if he means um, that we're, this is another vaccine and now we're, that we're adding to the, to, to the vaccine we're already getting, I mean, as long as you can give vaccines uh, safely and you're protecting people from being hospitalized and dying, sure. But you have to do that. I think the one thing we need to make sure happens before this vaccine rolls out is that there are con so-called concomitant use studies with flu vaccine. So that you know that you could get both those vaccines at the same time because the populations that are getting these vaccines would also be getting flu vaccine. So I think that if that's what he means, that that's what I would say. We, we did have a few eager beavers who uh, emailed in their uh, questions. And I'm actually not sure if I'm going to be reading this correctly. It actually sounds like someone's trying to get answers to their homework, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, they wanna know, number one, how many total number of amino acids are there in one copy of COVID-2? No idea. Okay. Does that help? No, 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 that's fine, that's fine. We, this is not the kind of show where you can phone a friend and get the answer, so that's totally fine. Um, what are the, oh, I'll skip that one because that seems weird. What are the chemicals used as an adjuvant in a vaccine in general? Right, so adjuvants um, are in a number of vaccines, um, which allows you to give fewer doses, allows you to give lesser quantities of, or lesser amounts of the active ingredient. Um, the, the, the only vaccine I think right now that, that where an adjuvant becomes important is, the, is vaccines like the Novavax vaccine, which is the purified protein vaccine, like the hepatitis B vaccine, the human papillomavirus vaccine, those are all adjuvanted vaccines. The adjuvant that they're using um, is called um, a matrix M1, which is a, um, it's, it's, um, it's basically a soap, a saponin, and it's the one that's used in Shingrix. And so it's a powerful adjuvant. I mean, I think that's probably why Novavax has actually the best antibody responses because of that adjuvant. So um, that's, the, that's the one adjuvant that I know about. Okay, and we have uh, one more email question before I go back into the Q&A box. And this person says they are not trying to stir anything up, but back in April, Dr. Offit, you vastly underestimated the death toll that COVID would impose on the United States. Um, and you might have already addressed this, you know, publicly, um, but they would like, this person would like to know what your comments are. And I know we did talk a little bit about this, but if you want to share uh, with the audience. Thank you for pointing that out. I'd like to say that, that not just that I was wrong, but I was willing to be wrong on CNN International. <laughs> you know, it's more like <laughs> millions of people. Because you're going to be wrong, be wrong. Um, I think, you know, what I did, and a lot of people did, I mean, there are a number of people who've gotten this virus wrong, but I think um, the, the thinking that I had at the time was, okay, he, this was in early March, is when I said that I could not imagine that we would have more deaths from this virus than we have from flu every year. I mean, flu this past year, you know, caused 780,000 hospitalizations and 60,000 60, or so deaths. I could not imagine it would approach flu. And the reason I couldn't was you looked at China, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, you looked at the size of their populations, and you looked at the death toll in those populations, and I thought, I just did the math. You know, here's China is five times bigger than us. They've done, they have 3,000 deaths. Therefore, we'll have fewer than 1,000 deaths. And, and, and same thing with, you know, South Korea and other, and even Italy. If, even if you look at Italy, where this, you know, was like an epicenter, especially in North Italy, they did better than we did. I mean, we have 4% of the world's population and 20% of the world's deaths. I didn't predict that. I think I assumed wrongly that we would create tests, that we would do contact tracing, that we would do the kinds of uh, hygienic measures that were done in other countries. And I was wrong. I mean, we were terrible at this virus and I just expected more than what we did. So yes, I was definitely wrong about that, which means I think that if I'm wrong about that, I must be wrong about everything. So I would ignore my entire talk. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love your, your, uh, your response, go, go big or go home if you're going to, to get it wrong. Uh, but I actually like that you were so optimistic on how, you know, we're, 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 we're America, we're supposed to really, yikes. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for taking that uh, head on. I, th I think a lot of us expected better. Um, are the, I have, one, I have a question here um, from Michael Bushnell. Uh, are the problems you mentioned with RSV and measles the genesis of today's anti-vax movement? No, the, the genesis of the anti-vaccine movement, as a general rule, the anti-vaccine people are remarkable in their capacity to always be wrong. They never actually, 
on the actual safety problems of vaccines. It's remarkable. I just wish they'd start picking sporting events, not that we have sporting events, but when we get sporting events again, they should start picking. It's, they're never right. It's, it's no. Would they, they, the birth of really the modern American anti-vaccine movement was April 19th, 1982, with a show on NBC called DPT Vaccine Roulette. Um, and the, the notion was that pertussis or, or uh, whooping cough vaccine caused permanent brain damage, which was wrong. And that's where they came in. It was, it was, that was the birth of the modern American anti-vaccine movement. No. I mean, if you look at that, I mean, look at the Cutter incident. You know, in 1955, that was warp speed one. In 1955, Jonas Salk made a polio vaccine. Took polio, grew it up, killed it with formaldehyde. Um, they, did a phase, they did a phase three trial. This 420,000 children got a vaccine, 200,000 got placebo, which is amazing. It was like the biggest medical trial ever. And, and that was done over a year. While that was being done, there, those, there were five companies that were making vaccines. Five were making vaccines at risk, meaning not knowing whether it worked, not knowing whether it was safe. And the vaccine worked and was safe. One of those companies made it badly. Um, Cutter Laboratories of Berkeley, California. They failed to fully inactivate the vaccine. As a consequence, about 120,000 children were inoculated with live, fully virulent polio virus, thinking it was a polio vaccine. 40,000 40, developed abortive polio or short-lived polio. 164 were permanently paralyzed and 10 were killed. I think it was the worst biological disaster in this country's history. And that didn't give rise to an anti-vaccine movement. Wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. And, and what my, our, my next question here, they actually are thanking you for this educational opportunity. And they have two questions. I hope I get them out articulate. No, while you're doing, I'm gonna turn on the light because it was, it, I look like the bad guy. I know, I know. It, it felt like skeptical inquirer after dark. I'm like, should I have a glass of wine? Did nobody tell me to turn my light down? Uh, yes, because people do want to see you as you answer these questions, sir. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. What is the minimum number of reported serious adverse events in phase three trials before a vaccine is considered not safe enough? Um, as a general rule, if, if a vaccine contains a serious, well, okay, take the flu vaccine. Um, the, the flu vaccine will periodically cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an ascending paralysis. It can be fatal in about one per million recipients. There, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, ascending paralysis? Does this uh, mean like from the toes up, you start, you get paralyzed? Progressively more and more paralyzed, yeah. Okay, this this feels like a Stephen King horror movie, but please continue, oh my gosh. So, um, now remember, natural polio virus also causes the same problem, at, at roughly at 17 times greater. So you're actually better off getting the vaccine than, than not, the vaccine arguably prevents this, but that would be one example. I think you have, um, Another example would be the, the, when, when the first rotavirus vaccine came out in 1998, um, it was found to be a rare cause of intestinal blockage called intussusception, which was not trivial. I mean, it was a medical emergency. One child died of the, of the million or so that were given the vaccine, and that drove it off the market. So, so for the most part, people are pretty intolerant of severe, severe side effects. Um, with children, because you know children are, are healthy, and and you know so you you know when you're giving them the vaccine, so for the most part, very rare side effects. Are, that that side effect occurred in one in thirty thousand children. Now, as it turns out, natural rotavirus infection also can do this, um, and and it, and do, does it about a little more frequently. So, um, it, th these are tricky, but for the most part, serious side effects are not part of vaccines. Uh, let's see. Why aren't vaccine formulations and dosages adjusted? per the weight of the individual or per the immune system issues of the individual? Yeah, because because these aren't drugs. I mean, it's not like you have a volume of distribution where you have to consider the blood volume. And you, if you inoculate somebody with a vaccine, it's taken up by local lymph nodes, processed, presented to the immune system. So it's not, um, there, there are some dosing differences for, you know, for DT and D, for D, DPT vaccine, there was an hepatitis B vaccine. There are some dosing differences by age, but for the most part, um, it's not that relevant. Okay, so in a, it's not Tylenol, is what you're saying. Not Tylenol. That's better. Uh, let's see. Uh, can these vaccines trigger a cytokine storm? I don't even know what that is. Yeah, so, so SARS-CoV-2, um, initially reported in China, um, Cytokine, cytokine is a protein that's made by your immune system. It's your immune system sort of gone haywire. So your immune system can kill you. Uh, it, it's... it's um, and, and so the, the cytokine that, that's typically found in this is something called interleukin-6. Um, I don't think so. I mean, well, you know, certainly people are going to be looking for that. 
um, as these vaccines roll out. But remember, these, these SARS-CoV-2 reproduces itself in your body hundreds and thousands of times. The vaccines that you're going to be getting don't do that. So they don't nearly drive the same immune response. Natural infections drive an immune response far more effectively than does vaccination. I mean, you know, I was infected with measles as a child. I probably have antibody titers three times greater than yours because you were probably born in a measles vaccine era. I'm guessing you were born after 1963, right? Wasn't that a good just, guess? Just a smidge, just a smidge. <laughs> I, I wore the age well, but yes, yes, I was. No, um, so my titers are probably about three times higher than yours. But the, you know, again, it's- uh, Are you bragging here, sir? They are you bragging? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I am, yes, I am. Yes, you are. <laughs> Okay, and and is that is that going to be the title of your next book? By the way, your immune system can kill you. I mean, I feel like somebody. True. I mean, the reason it, it's it is your immune system that kills you. I mean, when when you're infected with a bacteria, it's not the bacteria per se that kills you. It's your your massive inflammatory response that kills you. I mean, and the reason there's probably a reason for this. I mean, probably the reason is that your body gives you a certain time to to get better from an infection, and if it doesn't, then it calls you from the herd. I mean, it is good for you to leave the herd. Now, this is not an argument you can make, for example, to parents in an intensive care unit, okay? This mm -hmm. does not play there, but that's probably the reason. It's like, think of society. See, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Is there any sense yet as to how long a vaccine-induced immunity might last? Um, if it's like natural infection, it should be at least a year, but it's probably, it's not going to be measles is lifelong. I mean, two doses of measles vaccine, you're protected for the rest of your life. That, that's not going to be this, this vaccine. I mean, hopefully for, for at least a year, hopefully a couple years, three years, we'll see. It might be shorter lived than a year, uh, but we, we will know that. I mean, we'll know as we move forward. That seems really short. I mean, coming from the measles vaccine, you know, generation, you know, you got a shot, you're good. Well, until the chicken pox thing and the shingles thing comes back to get you. But that, is that very short? Is that because we don't know, you know, all the things that this, because it's a novel virus, that, that we're not sure? That you, you're, you're not predicting a long time where, where that vaccine is going to, you know, it's, serve it's you? The novelness of it. I think it's just the, um, that it's, uh, it's a coronavirus. I mean, human coronavirus is the same thing. You know, we, we seek human coronavirus to come into our, our um into our, our hospital every year. It's just, it's just these, aren't, these, these aren't generally aren't viruses that induce durable immunity, even just the, the normal human ones. Uh, how long was phase three last to determine efficacy? Months, no? Uh, if you're lucky, I mean, you just need to have, probably you need to have about 150 people in your placebo group to get sick moderate to severe disease. And, and, and that, assuming the vaccine works and you, you have far fewer cases in your vaccine group, that would probably be enough. I, I think the most optimistic scenario to me is it's possible that could all happen by December, um, but I'd be surprised if, it, if, if that, I mean, some of these phase three trials started have only recruited 4,000, 9,000 people. They have to recruit 30,000 people and then wait to give them a second dose. So <coughs> I think it's gonna take a while. <coughs> Yeah, I was. That was actually a question I had because those were the numbers that I was I was hearing. You, they, they're not getting thirty thousand people yet. You know, I, maybe they're not using pizza as an inducement. No, you know, um, how you to, to, what do you think? How much do you think? Take a guess. How much do you think you get to be part of these trials? What do you think you're paid to be part of these trials? Oh gosh, I don't know. I five hundred dollars. I have no idea. About two thousand. Two really? Now you're reconsidering. Excuse, right? excuse me, everybody. Um. <laughs> Well, okay, I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait till we're done with this. Uh, wow, two grand. Hmm, that's a down payment on something. Uh, wipe out a little debt. That'd be awesome. Um, this is a good question because you, you gave a really information-packed talk. Um, and the, uh, Thomas is asking, is it even possible to quickly and simply bring a friend or family member uh, you know, to these complicated processes? Like, is, it, is there a way to explain this? to lay people or, you know, an easier way to connect the dots or we, this is just hard stuff and we have to get over it. No, I, th I think you can explain it to people. I mean, if, if you're going to try to explain messenger RNA or DNA or these replication factors, which viruses, what you can say is that you're being inoculated with, with something that will cause your body to make this protein and then your body to make an antibody response to this protein. This is a key pro the key part of the virus. It's the surface of the virus. It's this protein that sticks out from the virus. And if you can protect if you can keep the virus from, from, from binding to your cells, you can keep the virus from infecting your cells or infecting you. I, I think there's simpler ways to explain this. I, I, you should be able to explain this to anybody. And if you, if you, it, it just de-jargonize it. I, I think that's possible. 
I mean, I think as a general rule, um, you know, at our vaccine education center, we, we create educational materials at roughly the eighth grade level, I, I, you know, which is to say newspaper level. I think, I think you can convey fairly sophisticated con concepts at the eighth grade level. I mean, you know, Scientific Americans like the 11th grade level, uh, um, the CDC communicates at roughly the fifth grade level because they want to include as many people as possible. But I think it's harder at the fifth grade level to, to have these, some of these more sophisticated concepts. But eighth grade, at yeah, the eighth grade level. I, I don't know. I, I, I've known a few savvy fifth graders in my time that uh, have, have run rings about around me despite my educational level. Like sometimes kids are smarter than we think. Um, it is 8.05. We are a little bit uh, past the hour. And so I, I want to be respectful of your time. And um, I did ask if you put your questions in the Q&A, if you could please, you know, form them in the form of a question. But I, I, I will make an exception here because someone uh, Christiana, if I'm, I can't pronounce your last name, but Christiana said she, that she, uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Offit for years uh, for his work to protect children with autism from pseudoscience. Uh, I was a developmental pediatrician and worked with families to encourage evidence-based approaches. You are one of my personal heroes. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's very nice. Uh, and so I, I, just, I just think that's a, a perfect way to wrap up. I do apologize. I did say we'd try to get to as many questions as we possibly could. And so I, I, I thank you. And, and, and Doc, you really answered uh, uh, very well. And by the way, for those of you who came to the recording late, it, it, we are recording. You can go back and review any of this. Uh, I know I'll have to. Uh, and, for, and so I, I thank you uh, um, for by giving us your expertise tonight. And if for you guys, if you do want to see the recording, that'll be up on skepticalinquirer.org. And I do invite all of you back, but well, over 200 of you stuck in there with us. And I love that. Uh, in two weeks, uh, Thursday, uh, uh, August 27th, I'll be having a conversation uh, with Carol Tarvis on the role of cognitive dissonance in the pandemic. And I'm hoping she can straighten me out because the more I read of her work, the more I realize I'm not the critical thinker I thought that I was. And then we're back again on September 10th with Seema Yasmin talking about viral BS, mythical myths, and why we fall for them. And I encourage you actually to, to sign up now so that you can reserve that space and time on your calendar. And so I thank Skeptical Inquirer once again for organi organizing this series. I, I also want to thank my technical team. Mark, Mark, that's you. You're the, you're the whole team. And I want to say thank you for handling all the behind the scenes tech for this. And of course, thank you, uh, Dr. Offit, for sharing your expertise and for helping us uh, put a dent in the nonsense. And I thank all of you in the audience, both live and on the recording, uh, for spending your valuable time with us this evening. And I'm really hoping that I get to uh, see you guys in the participants window uh, when we're back next time on August 27th. Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you.